Well, good morning, church. So very glad to be here in front of you again. Some of you probably feel less that way, but that's okay. That's all right. We are indeed this morning in the book of Proverbs. That's where we're going to spend our time primarily this morning. I say primarily because any of you that have sat under my teaching and preaching know that I like to cross-reference scripture. So buckle your seatbelts. Today's no different. I will do a fair amount of cross-referencing of scripture. But as I was telling the kids, Proverbs. How comfortable do we feel with the book of Proverbs? I mean, there's a whole book of the Bible called Proverbs, but other cultures have Proverbs, don't they? I spent time in China. The Chinese have all kinds of Proverbs. They do. The Indians have them. And I mean the subcontinent of India. There are tons of cultures with Proverbs. These, however, uniquely are inspired word of God. These are in Scripture. So these do take on a little bit new, of, of a different nuance. And in essence, that's what they are, is what I was saying to the kids. They're wise advice on how to live life. My family had some of its own Proverbs, and I'm sure some of your families did too. When I was a kid growing up, my dad's dad, my, who I call my papaw, he had some sage-like advice. And honestly, I have continued to use some of it. But there were three that have been marked in my memory, and they will go with me to the grave. And these are in no particular order. But my papa used to say, if you break it, it's broke. Now that is some sage-like wisdom. I know some of you need a minute to write that down. However, as I've gotten older, I actually have found that it is a little wiser than I thought when I was six or seven or eight years old. If you break it, it is broke. And that's true of toys, stuff, of relationships. And what's true that's not being said in that simple statement? It wouldn't be broke if you didn't break it, right? So be careful with the things that you have. Treat them with respect. That's what my papa was trying to tell us boys, me and my two rambunctious brothers. The other one was, we're, we're from the Midwest, and there is a game in the Midwest that is almost religious, and it's called Euchre. Oh, yes. Down here, you have spades, and it's similar, inferior, but similar. And Euchre, oh, we were a Euchre-playing family. And the advice from Papa was, son, play your big cards first. And again, it sounds simple on the surface, and it is. You know where I used it far more than Euchre? In my 18-year sales career. Transformed the way my wife, who was already successful, started to use her sales career. And she came home one day and she said, baby, I'm playing my big cards first. I used to like tell everybody about my homes and then I'd, I'd lay on the like good incentives and stuff at the end of the presentation. Well, sometimes you've lost them by then. And I've learned that I should play my big cards first. And then the other one, and I, I, I actually used this one a few weeks ago when I was out with uh, Wyatt and Darren, and we were branding some cattle and doing some dirty work, and, and um, had a blast, by the way. But uh, we were over at the Martins doing that kind of work, and, and we went to breakfast afterwards, and we were covered in some stuff that you get covered in when you do that kind of work. And so we all went to the bathroom, and we washed our hands, and of course not all of it came off, and I thought of the third and final thing my pep oil drilled into us, Son, if it don't come off with a good scrubbing, it probably ain't going to come off in your food. <laughs> These were the Proverbs I grew up with. We were fairly simple Midwest folk. And I ate breakfast that morning with that in mind. This morning, however, we're going to be looking at Proverbs from Solomon. Now, most of you know that name. Solomon was the third king of Israel, the son of David, the son of David, and he would be the final king of the United Kingdom, not Britain, the United Israeli Kingdom. It would divide after Solomon because of some of his own sin. So when you know Solomon extremely well and you've read his story a lot, sometimes you might look at Proverbs and go, do I want to take advice from this guy? He had some real problems. But again, what is this book? The infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. 
But let's see that Solomon, as he gives us these Proverbs, let's, let's see a little bit about what this actually means. First off, we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 29, or chapter 4, pardon me, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 to 34. This is who's giving us this words of wisdom. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and of all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, wiser than Ethan the Ishramite and Heman and Chalcol and Darda. These were really wise guys in their day, apparently. The sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees from the cedars of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. And he spoke of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So he was a man of renown. His wisdom was renowned in the ancient days. People from all over. A very famous one that's recorded in scripture is the Queen of Sheba who comes to Solomon's court to see how does this guy run such a, a wonderful kingdom? She would say to him, even your servants are happy. Your servants are joyous. She was amazed. And she too a queen. But his, his wisdom was also royal because later in Proverbs, we'll learn in Proverbs 25, verses 2 and 3, that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search it out. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. We as Americans struggle with that, don't we? We are very American, which is awesome. I love America. I think it's a great nation. I love being here. I love being an American. The Bible, however, was not written in America, nor by Americans. It was written far more from a cultural standpoint where our pastor and his wife are this morning, which is Great Britain, from a monarchy, from peoples that understood tiers of power. We struggle with that here. But the Bible does not. And... So the Bible tells us that there is something to this whole royal wisdom. And so this man, who was both royal and the wisest man maybe ever, but certainly of his day, brings us this book. And it says, starting in chapter 1 of Proverbs, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And I want to read through the first seven verses here, and then we're going to kind of unpack them. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel, to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what we're going to see here next is that wisdom has some advantages, great advantages, advantages listed here in Scripture that I would think all of us would do well to increase, correct? I mean, are any of you sitting out there or myself standing up here completely content with your wisdom? Do you handle absolutely everything that comes your way perfectly? I said to my Sunday school class on, uh, this morning, I said on the way here, my patience was tested because we live over off of uh, Archer Road, and today was the day. It happens every year, right around the end of the summer, and it was today. Some of you know what it was. It was the cyclists. God love them. And so from our driveway almost to the church, it was... Uh -uh. Oh, nope, can't go around or I'll die. Yeah, I, and I didn't handle it exceedingly well. I could have used a smidge more wisdom. 
So today we look at this wisdom literature, and I want you to see a few things. Number one, the Proverbs are going to give you instruction and understanding. David would say in Psalm 119, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119.11. He would go on later in the chapter, of course, the longest chapter in the Bible. He would go on later in the chapter in Psalm 119.105 and say, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So the wisdom of God's word does what for us? Well, first off, it gives us instruction and understanding, right? Of course. It helps us to see the world more clearly. Secondarily, it's going to give us right judgment. Ooh, how important is that? How important is it to judge things rightly? We live in a day and an age where there's very little right judgment going on. I could have started this service as Corey the male, and I could end the service as Corey the female. And you're all supposed to sit there and go, well, what? How bold of you? Because you don't want to get canceled or your job's lost or your bank account's frozen or God knows what will be next. So we need right judgment. Genesis 39, verses 6 to 12, are, is going to tell us about a young man who had right judgment. And we see the word of the Lord says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not throw, or pardon me, does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Isn't that the bravery that that would have taken? To snub this powerful woman in her own home? It's not that Joseph was wrong. She was off limits, as all married women are. And her husband most assuredly would have killed him had he committed that act and been caught. But you know what? Joseph wasn't really concerned as badly about that as he was something greater. What do you think that was? His relationship with God. His reputation, not before Potiphar, but his reputation before the Lord. And the way that Joseph was able to do this is because he had made a covenant long before these days happened. Let me tell you what I've learned over the years from personal failures. If you wait to the moment that a temptation, especially one of this magnitude, comes, likely as not you'll fail. I've, I've done it too many times. You'll fail. If you think in the moment, well, I'll be strong. Really? This book is filled with accounts of men greater than you and me who were not. So what we have to do is what we learned in the first point. Hide God's word in our heart that we may not sin against, against him. And this is what Joseph did. He had committed with his eyes, with his physical body even, I will not commit this kind of an egregious sin. And he did not. So it helped him make right judgments in the moment. Thirdly, wisdom is going to give us discernment. We see that word throughout scripture, right? Certainly it is named in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, is a spiritual gift. Now that is extraordinary discernment. That is spiritual discernment beyond that which maybe the normal Christian has. But we can all have discernment because, again, we remember what was earlier, the scripture reading for the day out of James. You need wisdom? Ask for it. God will give you discernment. But that's not the passage I want you to see in reference to discernment. 
If you have your Bible, flip to Romans 12, verse 2, or it'll be up on the screens, I hope. Romans 12, 2, Paul will say, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable, the perfect will of God. When I was a younger man, I found this verse perplexing. I wanted to get the cart before the horse. And what do I mean by that? I'm glad you asked. I wanted my actions to change while my mind was still corrupt. What does Paul tell us here is the appropriate order of those steps, however? He tells us your actions will follow when you wash your mind and you purify your mind with the word of God. You having sin problems? You got that nagging, persistent sin that you can't shake? And let's be brutally honest, you haven't been able to shake it for decades, some of you? I have them. How many times have you tried to muster up the strength to stop? Lots. Maybe you got a family member, a friend, coworker that's an alcoholic or a drug addict. You think they enjoy that? They don't. We've had them in our family. They do not. They're miserable. They wish they could stop. They beg to stop. They've tried to stop. I had a pastor tell me years ago, and this one, again, one of these things will go with me to my grave. I, some would call it a proverb. He said, Corey, why do you do what you do? I said, I don't know. He said, you're smarter than that. Stop being lazy and tell me. I guess because I want to. And he said, see, that wasn't so hard, was it? He said, son, we do what we do because we want what we want. And why do we want what we want? Because we think what we think. It's no more simple or difficult than that. Think about the garden. Adam and Eve are living in perfect everything. I mean, it's literally perfect. Eden is perfect. They have communion with God. And before her actions will betray her, what does Eve start doing? She starts thinking different thoughts. The serpent comes and lies and makes her go, wait a second. Maybe God is withholding from me. That tree does look awfully nice. That fruit looks awfully juicy. And it led to sin. We need discernment. We need it desperately. There's few things we need more in life than discernment. But that's not all that wisdom is going to give us. Next, it's going to increase our learning. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, that includes the Proverbs, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You ever sometimes think of the audaciousness of that of that those two verses, that promise? Or again, the audaciousness of James 1. Merely ask of me, and I will give you wisdom. These are huge promises. I know Steve talked uh, two weeks ago about all these promises in the gospel where Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. And of course it leads, I don't, I'm not saying it, it led to the sin that James and John committed by saying, hey, we want to sit on your right and left hand. Of course, God is not the author of sin. I think I talked about that about a month ago. But they so believed this statement, wrongly, that they asked for something they shouldn't have asked for. But these are audacious promises that the Lord gives us. So it's going to give us instruction and understanding. It's going to give us right judgment. It's going to give us discernment. It's going to increase our learning. Don't we need all those things? Well, then read the Proverbs. Thirdly, verse 7. 
we could probably spend an entire sermon literally on verse 7 alone. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is an intense thought and statement in Scripture. In Proverbs alone, I don't expect you to follow along with this because there's a ton. Follow along here, though, as much as you can. Proverbs 1.7, Proverbs 2.9, Proverbs 2.5, Proverbs 3, 8.13, 9.10, 10.27, 4.2, 26.27, 15.16, and, and verse 33, chapter 16, verse 6, chapter 19, verse 23, chapter 22, verse 4, chapter 23, verse 17, chapter 24, verse 21, chapter 28, verses verse 14, chapter 29, verse 25, and finally, chapter 31, verse 30. They all mention the fear of the Lord. Just in Proverbs. Parents and grandparents. You ever repeat yourself? <laughs> that was directed at me. Um, of course you do. And why do we repeat ourselves? Because our husbands and our children sometimes are hard of hearing. And it's not that they're hard of hearing. They're hard of understanding. They're hard of obedience, obeying. Why do you think that God that many times in just one book says the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. It's not just there, though. These are, We will actually look at a couple of them. Job 28, 28. You think Job needed a little wisdom? He went through a few things. Job 20, 28, 28 says, And to man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Psalm 111, verse 10 will say, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Sounds familiar. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. Solomon, when he writes Ecclesiastes later in life, will say in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, this very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. That's kind of a terrifying verse, guys. So what is the fear of the Lord? <gasps> my knees knocking together? A chill running up my spine? Maybe. I will not stand here and tell you that's inappropriate. Really, it's more of a reverential awe. Now, what, it, let's, let's look at a couple and just kind of show you what I mean. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, he's brought into the very throne room of God. He sees God high and lifted up, and he concludes this in verse 5. He says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Undone is a very small pitiful word for what he's experiencing. I don't know that we have a word in English that fully encapsulates what he's trying to say here. This will be directed more towards some of the young people, but some of you old pe older people have probably seen them too, maybe. The Marvel movies were a big, have been a big deal, and they culminated the first big part of the Marvel movies with this bad guy who gets this magical weapon and he snaps and half the universe literally disintegrates. Literally. That's kind of how the movies end. Sorry if I spoiled it for you. That's undone. Your very molecules separating from each other. That's, Isaiah. That's what Isaiah is communicating. I can't take this. I can't take what I'm seeing. He's not the only one. Ezekiel will also have an encounter with God. He will see this movable throne in Ezekiel chapter 1. You, you want to really read something that's going to stick with you. Go home and read Ezekiel 1. 
But he's going to have this vision of a movable throne, and it's the, the, the throne of God, and God is leaving Israel because they have betrayed him. And so his very presence is leaving the temple, and he's leaving Jerusalem, and he's leaving Israel on this mobile throne, this wheel within wheels and eyes all over. It's, it's a crazy vision that Ezekiel has. But Ezekiel will end his vision in Ezekiel 1.28 by saying, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face. And I heard a voice of one speaking. And finally, in Revelation, John the Revelator, in chapter 1, will see the risen and glorified Christ, the King. And at the end of his vision, in Revelation 1, 17, he will say, And then I saw him, and I fell at his feet as if I were dead. That's reverential awe, guys. That's what it looks like. To see God for the immensity that he is and have a rightful understanding of you versus him. But it's not just that. There is an aspect, I'm convinced, of just abject terror. Just absolute terror. For that, I want you to see Matthew when Jesus himself says in Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Let that sink in. Why do you think it is that Christians, from the beginning of the church age on, have been willing to go to their graves singing songs and praises and hymns with smiles sometimes on their face because they know all you can do is kill me. So what? You can just kill me. You know what happens the second I stop breathing? I see my Savior face to face. My faith is made sight. That is no bad thing. We cling to this life as if this is it. This is all we've got. And the saints would tell us, oh, stop being so silly. There's so much more, and it's so much better. But the lost just have terror. And secondly, about this whole fearing the Lord thing, let's just be honest. It's the most basic quotient of intelligence that you could have. This is not a high bar. People for most of human history until we got to the modern era were terrified of God. Now, they may have not known him as Yahweh or as the God that we worship. They may have been animists that worship the sun or the trees or the moon or any number of false gods. But you know what they all had in common? They knew that they were about this big and that there was something up there way bigger and it scared them to death. And what's hysterical to me is in our modern, arrogant hubris, we would say, well, those bunch of basically Neanderthals in the ancient times, they didn't know nothing. We're so much smarter. <coughs> really. They knew to be scared of God in whatever version of him they understood. But I want to give you some encouragement here at, here at the end. That fourth and finally, wisdom is not hard to find. And I, I know some of you are going, it seems hard to find. It's not. And this Bible's kind of big, so it's a little heavier than maybe the one you've got at home or the one you've got in your lap. This maybe weighs, I don't know, three pounds. It's just that hard. Can you pick up three pounds or less? Can you open it? Can you spend a little time every single day reading its pages? There's wisdom. There it is, freely. We don't understand the gift that this is, guys. We have no concept of what a treasure we hold. People in China give their lives to have a page, a scrap, that they'll memorize and pass on to another brother or sister in Christ for them to memorize and then pray that they get another scrap that they can memorize. Steve actually 
kind of reprimanded me a little bit when I sent in the um, bulletin for this week. He said, ah, the memory verse for next week is way too long. No one will memorize it. And I'm not picking on Steve. I'm picking on us. Because I know he's not wrong. You can't ask people to memorize two whole verses. I mean, I could tell you who was on like the 64 Mets and like who's leading this whatever sports thing. You can tell how sports oriented I am. You know, I mean, I can tell you all those stats. But man, two verses? But it's easy to find. Skip forward in, in chapter 1 here, real quick, to verse 20. This is how easy that it is to find. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open square. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the opening of the city gates, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Where's wisdom? Everywhere. It's right out in the city gates. It's not hiding. Wisdom is everywhere for us to find. Proverbs 9 will say it a little different. It says, she has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she will say to him, come, eat of my bread and drink of my wine that I have mixed. Forsake your foolishness and live. Go in the way of understanding. It's right out in the open, guys. Wisdom's right there. Seize it. Take it. Because why? Because wisdom will lead to repentance, and repentance leads to revival. Again, back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, 21 says, If a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, and he keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live and he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him because of the righteousness which he has done. He shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. Familiarize yourself with that verse. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He begs through his word, through wisdom, he begs them to turn from their wicked ways and live. And finally, what we read earlier in James, God gives it freely. All you need to do is ask. He gives freely of wisdom. Do any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask. And I will give liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to you. It's just that simple. So, finally, are you fearing the Lord? Are you seeking his wisdom through the disciplines of prayer and Bible study? Are you fearing and honoring him and applying his law? every day in your life? Or are you making decisions on the fly, hoping against hope that you'll make a good decision in the moment, that you'll honor him when it comes time? We are wiser now in 2023 than we were in 2019, I hope. Many men of God who thought they were strong men of God, listened to the world, and they closed down their churches for a month, or six, or 12, or 18, because, oh, I'm afraid. And they told us we can't worship. I mean, abortion clinics can be open, and strip clubs, and essential businesses, whoever gets to decide that. But... Not church. You know what we needed in that moment? Men of wisdom. Men of courage. Shepherds of flocks who had the wisdom and the courage to say, no, no. We'll be here every week. You know where to find us. Please come and worship, and if you're one of those that don't like it, here we stand. Come and find us. That's wisdom. Let's pray. Father God, we desperately need you. We live in an age where the spirit of the age is a stupor of ignorance. 
We are lazy. We are foolish. We do not read your word, and we do not apply it when we do. Like the ancient Israelites, we have walked away from you. May we learn from the Solomonic wisdom that the only right response to the magnitude of God is to humble yourself before him and to beg mercy and to ask for the free wisdom that he'll grant us. Lord, if someone here doesn't know that today because they don't know you today, Lord, I pray that they would come to know you. That's the first step of wisdom, is to repent of your sins, to see Jesus Christ high and lifted up, the, the substitutionary atonement for all sin, and ask him to be their Savior and come to faith in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.